Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I guess we can still say that, right? Merry Christmas, even though it's the day after Christmas. And I just want to say welcome to the special online service here at Cedar Creek. I appreciate you joining us, whether you're still on the road coming back from the holidays or whether you're at home with family or friends, wherever you are. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. You know, it's kind of interesting when you think about all the time and energy and effort that we put into getting ready for Christmas, how quickly Christmas seems to come and go. I mean, we've spent weeks, maybe some of you have spent months shopping for the right gift and getting all your decorations put up and just right. And then Christmas morning comes and boom, like it's over in a flash. It's a, a blur, a tornado of wrapping paper and empty boxes and squeals from kids. And usually by about 10 o'clock, you know, it's just all over with. And so many of us are kind of waking up today in a little bit of a post-Christmas holidays, maybe surrounded by a lot of empty boxes and torn wrapping paper and a whole lot of decorations that uh, have to be taken down and, and put up. Maybe some of us are uh, waking up to the reality that we overdid it on our Christmas shopping and now we're facing the reality of some really big credit card bills that may be coming in the mail. And so it's not unusual for us to feel a little bit of a post-Christmas let down. Maybe that's where you are today. You were so excited about Christmas, but now that it's over, you're feeling let down. Or, or maybe you're a little let down today because it didn't go. Your Christmas didn't go exactly the way you've planned it. Or, or maybe you're just feeling a little overwhelmed as you're, you know, you've got to go back to work and back to school and back to the real life after Christmas. Or maybe some of you are feeling a little bit of relief that Christmas is over. You weren't really looking forward to it because of a loss or something you've been through. And, and you're kind of relieved because now it's finally over. But listen, whatever you're feeling today, I believe God has a message of hope and help for every one of us. Because just because Christmas is over doesn't mean that our celebration of Jesus' birth has to be over. You know, in fact, we often forget that the Christmas story in the Bible doesn't end with the birth of Jesus. It's not all about this one silent night. You know, in the days after that first Christmas, Mary and Joseph don't pack up and head back to their hometown of Nazareth to start a new life as a family with their new baby. In fact, they stay in the town of Bethlehem. In fact, they're there for months, uh, somewhere between 18 and 24 months. Now, yes, they leave the stable and they move into a home and begin their new life in Bethlehem. It's fact that it's at that house where the wise men show up in the Christmas story. And Matthew describes Jesus not as the baby Jesus, but now he is a young child. You know, when you look at most of our nativity scenes or you go to a Christmas pageant, they kind of all give the impression that all of these things took place in that one night. You know, Jesus is born and the shepherds come and see him and they go and tell everybody. And then right after the shepherds leave, you know, the wise men show up with their gifts. But that's not how any of this went. In reality, the, the Christmas story takes place over several months. And, and we read this aftermath of the birth of Jesus story in Matthew chapter 2. Here's basically what happens. Sometime between about 18 and 24 months after Jesus' birth, a group of wise men, magi the Bible calls them, they show up in Jerusalem looking for this newborn king. See, they had seen a special star in the night sky and they recognized that this star represented and marked the birth of a new king. And so they wanted to come and welcome this new king and bring gifts. And so they begin to travel from the east and it took them a long time to get there. But now they finally arrive in Judea. And of course, they go straight to the capital city of Jerusalem and they go to the palace where Herod, King Herod lives because 
if a new king has been born, you would think that king would have been born in a palace. And so they show up and they tell King Herod about the star and that they have come to worship and to give gifts to this newborn king. And this news freaks Herod out. I mean, it makes sense. If you are the current king, the last thing you want to hear about is a new king, especially if that king is not your son or, or not from your lineage. But, but Herod plays it cool. He calls in a group of Jewish religious scholars and he asks them, you know, where did the prophets say this new king, this king of kings is going to be born? And so the, the religious scholars tell Herod that the prophets predicted that the Messiah king would be born in the little town of Bethlehem, about two miles from the capital of Jerusalem. So Herod goes back and he tells these wise men, he says, yes, you need to go to Bethlehem because that's where this new king is going to be. And by the way, guys, once you find where this new king and his family are living, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him as well. Now, of course, Herod has no intention of worshiping Jesus, the newborn king. He wants to destroy this threat to his kingdom and his way of life. And so now the wise men leave Jerusalem. They travel to Bethlehem and somehow, we don't know how, but they find Mary and Joseph and now the child Jesus living in a house in Bethlehem. And they offer their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and they worship him. And as they're getting ready to head back to Jerusalem to let Herod know where this new child king is living, God warns them in a dream through an angel. He tells them, don't go back through Jerusalem. Don't go back to Herod. And so the wise men go back home a different route. And that's where we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. Matthew says, When they had gone, when the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. I mean, think about that. You're, you're just a few months into settling into your new life in Bethlehem and you're trying to figure out how to raise God in the flesh. And then all of a sudden now you got to pack up and you got to head out to this strange land all the way down in North Africa in Egypt. But Joseph, who was a faithful man, even though I'm sure he didn't understand what was going on, he was obedient. Notice verse 14. It said, so he, so Joseph got up and he took the child and his mother, that's Mary, during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And notice what he does. He gave orders to kill all of the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. You know, this is a part of the Christmas story that we often leave out of our pageants and our nativity scenes. It, it doesn't fit with our sanitized version of, of what the birth of Jesus was like. But this was the reality. This was the aftermath of that first Christmas. Think about that for a minute. The Prince of Peace has been born on earth, and yet the aftermath is anything but peace. There's chaos. Chaos for Mary and Joseph and young Jesus. Chaos and grief and mourning for the people of Bethlehem and the mothers of Bethlehem whose children were slaughtered by an angry tyrant king. 
The birth of the Prince of Peace doesn't seem to bring more peace to the people. It actually seems to bring less. Maybe that's a little bit of your story this Christmas. Maybe you had some expectations for what celebrating the birth of Jesus would be like and what having God with us would really mean in your life. Or, or maybe you had this idea at some point that if you gave your life to Jesus, that the circumstances of your life would, would just get better. Maybe your financial situation would get better if you were following Jesus. Or, or maybe your marriage would be fixed. Or, or maybe things would be better with your children. Maybe that's what you thought a life following Jesus would lead to. And that's why this part of the Christmas story I think is so important because it reminds us that a, a relationship with Jesus is not a path to a more comfortable life here and now, but it is a path to a more purposeful life. That the peace and joy that the birth of Jesus brings to us is not a surfacey peace or joy that's tied to the up and down circumstances of our lives. It is an inner peace that passes all human understanding. I think that's maybe what Jesus was talking about 30 years later when he would say to his disciples before he was to leave them, peace I give you, my peace I leave with you not as the world gives, not the kind of peace that you can find in this world and the circumstances of this world, but a deep settled confidence that comes from knowing and trusting that God has a plan and a purpose for your life, that you were created on purpose for a purpose and that everything you go, to, go through the good days and bad days, the, the joyous circumstances and the painful struggles, that God works and moves in all of those to bring apart His greater purpose, His kingdom now on earth. And the peace and joy we can have from getting to be a part of that. I, I don't know the chaos you're going to face in the aftermath of Christmas this year. I know there was a lot of chaos in the aftermath of that first Christmas. But I also know that the same God who moved and worked in that chaos in Bethlehem is still working and moving in your life and your circumstances today. Another cool aspect of this aftermath of Christmas story is God's provision. Uh, it's amazing how God provides for Mary and Joseph and the young child Jesus in their flight to Egypt. I mean, think about this. The, the wise men show up months after Jesus is born, and they show up with some interesting gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Seems like strange gifts to give to a young child, and yet no sooner do the wise men leave behind their gifts when Joseph is told he's got to pack up his family and flee to Egypt. And, and they've got nothing, right? These are very poor people and they're going to a place they've never been before where they're not going to have any family or any kind of support and yet here they sit with gold and frankincense and and myrrh and I, I don't know uh, how they use those gifts but I do know this gold would have been a great thing to have when you're on the run and having to flee to a foreign country and as I, I think about that I think about God's provision in our lives and sometimes they come in ways that we could never even have imagined. I mean I don't I don't know what circumstances you're dealing with now or what struggles you're gonna have in this new year, but I do know this that in Jesus you can find real peace. And I also know that whatever you go through God will provide all that you need. The Bible says that God promises to meet all of our needs according to His riches in glory. He has more than enough to get us through whatever we're going through. And He has promised to give that to us as we lean into Him, as we depend on Him. And so I just want to encourage you this week as you start to put away the 
decorations of Christmas, as you start heading back into work and school and the real life, I want to encourage you, keep the celebration going. Keep on celebrating Jesus' birth and what his birth means and the difference it makes in our lives. And I'm going to close our time together in prayer. But before I do that, uh, parents, I just want you to know right after this stream, we're going to be streaming some great content for children. So just stay tuned here. Uh, great stuff coming from our Kids Creek to help you uh, celebrate or keep the celebration going with your kids on this morning after Christmas. So thank you so much for being here. And let's pray together. Well, Jesus, I thank you so much for... Uh, all that this season means and that even though our celebration of Christmas is over, we can continue to celebrate what your presence with us means. Pray for those who are struggling, uh, those who are going through difficult circumstances, that they would find that inner peace that comes from trusting in you. God, I pray that you would meet their needs in the miraculous way that you provided uh, for Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus for their uh, flight to Egypt, that you would meet people right where they are today. Lord, I thank you that we can trust in your promises. I thank you that in the aftermath of all the chaos and busyness and maybe the fatigue we're feeling, that we can simply sit in your presence and find hope and strengthen you. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this time together. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.